Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our panel today on reducing food waste. This panel is going to discuss how social enterprises are developing solutions to the problem of food waste and how that connects to climate action. I'm going to set the stage with a little background information. As some of you might know, roughly a third of the food in the world that's produced is never eaten. Think of all the energy, water, house gas emissions, and those emissions occur at various points along the supply chain. Food rots in farm fields generating methane. Food waste occurs in storage and distribution. In high income areas, very often food is wasted in homes and restaurants where one may order or buy or be served too much. Often two retailers and customers reject food because of its appearance. Points, greenhouse gas emissions. Drawdown, which I know many of you tuned in to hear Daniel Rockberg at morning, which is a wonderful um, project to identify and rank the most important solutions to reversing global warming. It has ranked among the top 10 solutions, three that relate to food. And number three is reducing food waste. Number four is a plant-rich diet. So food is really critical when we start looking at these issues. The global economic, environmental, and social cost of food is estimated to be about $2.6 trillion, which is nearly equal to the GDP of France. And of course, not only is reducing food waste important for global climate change, but also for a limited We have a 60% gap estimated between food availability and food needed by 2050. And close to home here in Fulton and DeKalb counties, our food insecurity rates are generally about 20 times higher than the national average. So we are so fortunate to be joined today by two exceptional panelists who are going to talk about their social enterprises and how they're tackling these dual issues of climate change and eliminating hunger. So we're um, so lucky to be joined by Kesey Stokes and Zed McLaurin, and I'm going to ask each of them, starting with Akisi, to please introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about your company and specifically how you see your enterprise supporting climate Thank action. Thank you, Kina. Um, and thanks everyone who joined our panel today. Once again, I'm Akisi Stokes, co-founder and CEO of Wonder Grubs. We are a locally Atlanta-based ag tech company. We combine IoT with the production of insect protein, um, edible insects and not edibles that you find in Colorado. Uh, but bugs, and we produce them to be used as a food ingredient or additive, also as feed for livestock and reptile, in addition to um, enrichment for soil as a fertilizer. And so my co-founder and I, Kareem Nelson, uh, who wasn't able to join us today, we got started in 2016, actually, the business uh, on the premise of trying to address food crisis um, or combating um, food security during after a natural disaster. So we were really struck by Hurricane Katrina and also the earthquake in Haiti in 2010. And one of the things that we doubled down on or focused in on was one thing that people typically don't think about, uh, Keynut, is the, the amount of time it takes for the agriculture to restore itself after a natural disaster. So the degradation of soil, um, you know, destruction of the infrastructure, irrigation systems, loss of harvest and livestock. So along with, you know, bringing in food relief, you know, still the ability for people to produce food on their own and having arable land takes years um, for it to recover. And so we landed through this long winding road on insects as a solution, looking at an FAO report that the UN had done at the time around 2013. Uh, and we caught up with it in 2015. And we I ordered like 10,000 mealworms, like we landed on grubs. We went through silkworms, crickets, a whole uh, iteration of many different bugs and realized um, through farming them for about a year that we didn't have to wait for a crisis to take place for them to be a more viable solution for a sustainable value chain. 
And so from there, you know, Wonder Girls was born. We started cooking with them. Um, we started introducing them to the market through a cookie, something that was friendly, something that was palatable. Um, and then actually when China decided it wasn't taking any more trash from the rest of the world, we decided to pivot and we were like, you know what, we really should become a raw supplier of grubs and we should look at start looking at them as a zero waste solution. And so we had learned along with many others, probably around the same time, that they could be used on newspaper plastic. Um, they also, you know, again, we were already using them as a food grade um, product for human consumption. And we met up with Gooder. We met with Zeb, um, who was kind enough to let us experiment. You know, what would it need to look like to have them eat um, waste, not just food waste, but also um, refuse. And so then with the advent of COVID, that provided an even bigger opportunity to say, okay, this is really is a zero waste solution. Food waste, they can eat it. They can be eaten as food. Their waste can be an input as fertilizer. And so they essentially provided a zero waste solution. And so that's kind of where we are today. Zeb. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Zeb McLaurin. I'm the sustainability director at Gooder. Uh, so Gooder is a surplus food recovery uh, management company. Um, so I guess, you know, some brief history. We started off in 2017. Uh, it was mainly geared towards uh, fire, combating food insecurity. Uh, how it kind of started was uh, our founder, Jasmine Crow. Uh, she's always been a social entrepreneur. Uh, feeding people was, was, her, was her big thing. Uh, one day she was under a bridge. She has... Um, an event called um, uh, Soul. Oh man, she had an event. She had a recurring event under a bridge where she used to feed folks. It went viral one day on Facebook, and um, you know that's kind of when the idea was born. People were asking, you know, who donated the food, uh, what restaurants were giving out the food. You know, in reality, she was uh, couponing, uh, cooking all on her own. Um, and then you know she thought, you know, restaurants should be, you know utilizing or donating their surplus food. So that's when uh, she kind of just went out, started, you know, pitching this idea, trying to build out the tech for it. Um, and then when I came along about a year later, 2018, January 2018, um, you know, we were essentially doing pickups in our own vehicles, um, you know, one day and that grew into us uh, having a van servicing the airport or at um, the convention center. Uh, we're doing pickups in other cities and states now. Um, and on top of that, you know, not only are we now or do we collect uh, edible surplus food, now we're collecting uh, organic waste, you know, in general. So not just the uh, not, you know, when, when you're looking at the, uh, the EPA food recovery hierarchy, uh, not only are we feeding people, now we are, you know, having those industrial uses in that compost, uh, textile, etc., um, and with our technology and our portal and our SaaS platform, you know, we have that reduction aspect as well. So we're really trying to become a one-stop solution for food waste. Um, and then from there, we're kind of actually growing into a sustainable waste management company in general, because we're finding that our technology not only is it able to track edible surplus edible food, organic waste, but you're able to track, you know, other recyclable materials as well, and even just waste in general. Uh, you know, things like pallets and cardboard are probably the two uh, main things that we track in our system on our own behalf. Um, but, you know, aluminum batteries, uh, plastics, uh, things like that, uh, you're able to track as well. And so that's kind of the that's kind of where we're headed right now. Uh, we're definitely you know, we're still a young company, so we're trying to find our niche. Um, you know, COVID struck. We're def we definitely had to make a couple of pivots. You know, we feeding people has always been our thing. So we've ended up. Uh, delivering groceries to food insecure, um, you know, homes around the Atlanta metro area. Uh, so that's been the main thing that's been keeping us afloat, especially a lot of our clients have gone either, you know, reduced business or just out of business momentarily. Um, and then so we're also looking at, you know, getting this SaaS piece, the SaaS tool out to not just uh, food service providers, but as well as, you know, other waste haulers, um, even manufacturers, et cetera, so that this data can have a flow from the bottom all the way up to the top of the of the supply chain 
and we're able to really utilize that and harness that data to tell a story as well as make more uh, educated decisions. Um, so we wanted, as that relates to uh, food waste reduction and the climate fight, you know, trying to, trying to keep that food out of landfill as well as, you know, reduce the amount of food being generated in the first place. So that 30% that goes to automatically goes to waste uh, gets reduced. So that's, that's where we are now. So it's clear you're both data driven and I want to get back to that in a minute. But first, I want to ask, you know, so many of us are seeking purpose and meaning through our work. So I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about how you unite being a for profit business with doing good. Akisi, will you start? Sure. So, um, you know, when so we also have a SaaS platform that concentrates specifically just on the, the life cycle and management of insects and utilizing them for, for three different things. Um, and also being able to share that open data. So when we looked at starting the business, we, we definitely knew that we did not want to be nonprofit. Um, we wanted to be for profit specifically once we decided to pivot. You know, Keynet, as I said, originally we started looking at we were looking at food security and crisis, you know, after natural disaster. But when we started looking at it as normalizing it as an everyday alternative protein that also had different touch points along the value chain um, to, to solve a lot of the food waste issues, we realized that there were also opportunities to make a social to make an impact financially for people, also from a workforce development standpoint. So, for example, we're working on a shipping container now that we're launching the end of November in Midtown, smack dab next to um, Piedmont Park and Atlanta Beltline. And one of the things that we want to showcase to people is not just a grub hatchery, what it looks like to grow insects, but also specifically because they are insects, when you talk about portability, when you talk about mass, when you talk about low entry barrier, um, when you talk about reduced cost and optimization compared to traditional livestock as a as a contributor to a solution, we realized along, again, that value chain that we also could incorporate workforce development. So showing people how to utilize IoT technology, like what the heck does that even mean? So we talk about like that economic chasm between you know, people who may be left out of this technological revolution and you know, digitizing horticulture, helping kind of close some of those gaps and teach people some of those new skills that are transferable. Um, and so talk about building our local economy. That was one. Another touch point for us was, again, you can grow your own food. You know, so COVID, again, really exposed things that people already knew were there um, and gooder and the like. And companies have talked about just how tenu tenuous our the distribution channel is, our supply chain. And just within a month, how we were able to disrupt it, you know, by being sheltered in place. And so what do people do then? Um, and, and then when you talk about overproduction of food or, you know, we produce food massively for a lot of different reasons, convenience stores, retail stores, restaurants, before we even get, you know, to going to a grocery store. And so how, so why do we have 800 million who have malnutrition? It's the affordability, you know, and the ability to even have the income to afford it. So again, showing them how to produce something, being a part of the technology, having distributed farms, so that not only are we addressing climate change, producing something that's also, you know, sustainable, that su provides sustenance for people, but also giving people a skill that they can take somewhere else, or if they need to use it on their own and feed themselves. Or again, it's a global market, be a part of our company and be able to contribute to that global market. And so that two or $300 supplemental income that you get back into your household may make a difference for some families. And so that was why we wanted to be for profit, but social impact <laughs> at the same. Great, Excellent. I can piggyback after that. Oh, uh, so yeah, so I guess you know one one main thing why you know we had we needed to go for profit is uh, you know, we have bills to pay for one, uh, for two. <laughs> but um, so yeah, so we there is a big misconception with good or being you know for profit or a nonprofit. Uh, when people hear about the things that we do, you know, the, the great, uh, the, the amount of social impact that our company is involved in, uh, people love to assume that we're this big nonprofit organization. 
uh, which is very much, you know, we're the very much opposite of that. We're a very small for-profit company, uh, startup company. Uh, so pretty much, you know, because we kind of do the same things, you know, we go recover, you know, surplus edible food. We take it to nonprofits. We take it to food insecure communities. People can benefit from it the most, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but we don't look at ourselves as, you know, another donation company or a donation platform. Uh, we really look at ourselves as a waste management company. You know, it's just it's just a much cleaner, um, you know, nicer um you know, it has a nice, a much nicer, you know, upfront, you know, face value to it than just throwing it in a dumpster in the back of your building and a big truck, you know, coming to take it to the, to the landfill and burying it. Um, so that's definitely, you know, the key thing. And then the data piece is very important too. So not only, um, you know, are you doing the right thing by donating it or just recycling it in general, you really get a lot of value and insight from that data that's collected. So for instance, you know, we've had a client in the airport that was probably throwing away somewhere between 400 to 500 bagels every single night. We would walk in and collect, you know, these huge bags of, of just different bagels. Uh, over time, they were able to utilize that data and say, OK, you know, if we're throwing away for about, let's say, you know, 400 every single day for 30 days, that's about 12,000 bagels every single month that you're throwing away that you, you know, you've done, you cooked, put it on the line, prepped prepare, you know, cut it up and, you know, at the end of the day, typically throw it away. You, now you have good or now it's being donated and you're getting that tax uh, deduction for it. But, uh, you know, you could utilize that reduction aspect from the data and say, hey, you know, go back to purchasing and say, OK, let's, you know, if we're throwing away 12,000, let's take a, a step in the right direction and stop ordering about 10,000 bagels every single month. So now you're saving money that way. You're not putting the food in the uh, in the dumpster anymore. You know, when, it, when you get that landfill bill, you have less weight because food is probably going to be the main thing or the majority of the weight in your dumpster, as well as, you know, you probably have less frequent, you'll need less frequency of your dumpster being picked up. So you have reductions there and then you have the tax piece and then you also have the added PR value as well. Um, you know, a lot of companies, they have, they, they're, their um their image uh you know there it has a more of a positive connotation now within their you know backyard communities because we end up taking the food to those nonprofits or those organizations that are right there within arm's reach of them um and then we just also think that you know you don't have to be a nonprofit to do the right thing you know i feel like we really got to get away from the whole uh, if you want to do something positive or positively impact the world in some aspect, you got to be a nonprofit. Like that doesn't that narrative just has to go away in its whole in, in its entirety. Especially, which I'm happy now that I, mean, I feel like the world is definitely headed in that direction. Uh, you know, being a regular company, you know, having you know a moral compass, and that your entire mission is to you know improve society as a whole and still charging people, you know, regular clients to get it done. Um, you know, and then it's, very, it's a very new space, especially, you know, the organics recycling or and the composting haulers out there. Um, you know, it's very new. We do have, luckily we do have some leeway with some different policies in, in different states that are, you know, at boosting or just helping that industry grow. Um, you know, but as far, but there are still some issues there as far as infrastructure, you know, you can have all the haulers in the world, but if there's nowhere to take it, then, you know, you got an issue there. Um, but luckily, you know, we are seeing some things in policy, especially with Biden in office. Now they're, they are making strides to help grow that, uh, industry. Um, but we also believe, you know, we're very much a pioneer in, uh, in what we do. Um, but we really do believe that where, you know, the U S and the rest of the world is headed now. Um, that being a for-profit company in this space is definitely something, was definitely the right um, decision for us to make. And, and Kina, I kind of want to add to one thing. I'll play. That, that, um, talks about heading in a new direction. So, you know, one of the things when we looked at, you know, pivoting our company and once we were like, okay, we don't have to use this just for a food source. It can touch on, you know, it touch on many things throughout the value chain. But I like what Zeb talks to because it speaks to just at large, just globally. You know, we're we're connected in so many ways that we haven't been before globally. And so when you talk about 
um, rethinking how we do business, you know, agriculture in particular for us was very linear. You know, I grew up on a farm. So, you know, from the ruta to the tuta, you know, the cows, pigs, you know, feeding them crops and half of the crops that we were using were feed. You know, it wasn't going to people necessarily. And so a lot of the food that we're growing isn't necessarily going to people for consumption. It's for byproducts of so many other things, you know, and so we don't readily think about that. That's a lot of production. You know, that's a lot of industrialized agriculture to support a lot of different industries. And so even those, some of those industries are trying to become, you know, more ethical or moral or green or however you want to coin it in the way to do business. But there's been such a quickening in the last 40, 50 years of the damage that we've done just to natural resources. And so we've got to start rethinking, you know, what does regenerative agriculture look like and who are all the players and contributors? It's not just one solution, just one company, you know, so it's more than just wonder grubs and gooders of the world, but start to think more from a circular standpoint, circular economy. And so you're seeing that a lot. You know, so I'm hoping that the U.S. is kind of following that trend of circular economy is continuously using those resources, you know, trying to get as best as you can to zero. You know, what does it need to look like economically, you know, bene beneficially and also how what are the touch points, you know, from a social impact standpoint? So really start to think circular in the way that we do business, whether you are a 150 year old company, you know, or whether you are a two, three, four, five year startup. Those are great points. And I'm fascinated by your personal stories. And I just wonder if you would both share a little bit about how you got where you are and what drives you and lessons learned along the way. I'll go first. I keep going first. Zeb, you go first. <laughs> yeah, so for me, I like to say I kind of went down this rabbit hole and what was it like June, July, 2017? So for me, it all, I guess my story starts because my dad, in 2013, my dad got a Tesla. Um, and I've always been a car person my entire life. So I started watching Tesla's drag race gas cars on the track. Um, and they were, especially the, the, the um, you, you, can, you can actually modify and get fast uh, performance versions of Teslas in case nobody knew that. So uh, I was watching them race, um, you know, all these other cars and they were just, they were just killing them, especially in that first quarter mile because Teslas don't, they don't have to shift gears. You know, they, they just go, you know, accelerate straight through. They don't have that split second when you're going from first, second, second, to third, third, fourth, et cetera. So what happened there was that led me to looking at, you know, Elon Musk, Tesla, then Elon Musk, then Solar City, and then got me on the whole, um, you know, renewable energy uh, thing. And then how that led to a lot of like social, um, you know, social injustices around the world. And then I eventually did a whole paper of how, you know, Africa can harness enough uh, renewable energy to power the entire uh, earth. Um, and then, you know, I just started looking at, you know, sustainability as a, as a whole. And I got really into this, um, the show, this uh, channel on YouTube called Vox. And they were talking about food waste and food insecurity in America. And then there were a couple of, you know, small, smaller apps at the time that, you know, that were super hyper local. Um, but, you know, you could take a, essentially you could take a picture of the food and then it goes to it pings everybody in the building and say, hey, you know, we have this leftover food. And then right at that same time, when I was started, when I started, uh, you know, piquing the interest in that, Jasmine, uh, well, let me rewind. So I was in, um, I was at, I was in my sem first semester of my senior year at Morehouse taking entrepreneurship class. And then we had these things called TREP talks where entre entrepreneurs would come in and talk about their company. Uh, Jasmine came in probably about three weeks, you know, after me really just getting into this whole food waste thing. And she talks about Gooder. And so a light bulb just went off in my head. It was like, let me just ask for an internship. Um, so that, you know, I just ended up getting an internship probably about two, three months down the road. Um, but I, we kind of looked at it very, um, you know, kind of in a different way. She always looked at it from a social impact standpoint. But when she had started, when she was describing a company, I was looking at it from a very much of an environmental uh, aspect at first. Um, so I like to tell people that most of the I like to tell people that, you know, she's very much more she's very much of the feed more. I'm very much of the waste less aspect of the company. Um, and then, you know, from there, I kind of 
people ask me all the time, you know, did I major in sustainability or environmental um, studies or anything like that when I was in school? I said, no, I was a finance major. And I like to tell people I minored in econ because I was one class short of that. But uh, <laughs> but that that econ, you know, that that e those econ courses really, uh, I think, helped me not stand out, but helped me really like hone in on you know, on sustainability and the environment and econ and the economics behind it all. Uh, Cause it's really what kind of like inspires me about it the most is that we have this huge international problem with, you know, food waste, the entire supply chain, the logistics behind it, uh, storage facilities, uh, you know, just the, and then when it gets to the grocery stores, you know, it has to have a certain presence about it for people to want to buy it. The fact that grocery stores can turn away food, you know, if it, if one you know piece on a on a uh, pallet has a blemish or something like that, that's insane. But um, you know, I just I've always in, enjoyed trying to solve big problems, um, and this is just definitely one that you know piqued my interest, and I'm actually grew quite passionately about, um, especially going now, going from the food waste to energy space now. Uh, that we're trying to tap into, that's really, um, you know, something that I'm really trying to drive us to get more and more involved in. And we we actually are because I'm, you know, starting to speak to more and more people who are building it, building anaerobic digesters and biofuel production facilities and all these things. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much, it's pretty much my story. So, I, you know, I just, from intern to sustainability director, I don't want to date myself. So I'm on the other end of my life. So 15 years finance, 15 years IT. Um, and, you know, coming out of Emory in the 90s, it was like IPO crazy. You know, you could think of whatever you want. It was employees market. You could ask for a Beamer at your interview, you know. So um, sky was the limit in terms of being able to, you know, create and innovate however you want it. So that was kind of like what the environment, the landscape looked like you know, coming out of college for me. And so fast forward to the latter half of my life, just really, um, you know, we, we typically when, when we get asked this question, you know, my partner and I, we, we both met at Emory, but um, didn't come together until later. And so he grew up on an island, um, lived through Hurricane Hugo, so knew firsthand what it was like, you know, to not have water for months and have your food sh shipped in and things of that nature. And so both of us also just getting the opportunity to travel to see different ways of how people eat. Um, and, and so for me, I was exposed to a bug like in middle school. Um, a friend's father traveled, brought back some chocolate covered ants. I was a kid who would eat anything and try anything. It tastes like a raisinette. I was like, OK, I'm sold. So it wasn't close to the idea, you know, fast forward to now. Um, but so, you know when we started looking at the direction in which a lot of communities were headed, um, everyone has to eat, you know, so whether you're a millionaire, whether you're someone who makes $20,000, whether you're someone who's unemployed, you know, um, everyone has to eat. And so when we started looking at the affordability of the accessibility for people, you know, like literally going to a neighborhood and driving 15 miles and there not being a grocery store, you know, um, or along that path, there being 15, 20 convenience stores, we we're like, okay, there's a problem, you know, and how do we fill in that gap and how can you do it from a low cost standpoint? And, and again, you know, for us, we kept just seeing more and more how the bugs could help us do that. And so when you ask, like, how do we get here? Um, he and I always have like 50,000 ideas in our head. <laughs> uh, he's definitely the more practical of the two, the co-founder. But we really saw that we were able to solve a lot of issues using the bug. You know, when Zeb talks about the waste less piece, we saw how we were able to tap into the waste less piece. Um, and so for us, we're food production. So in terms of, hey, we can get rid of things at the same time of creating something. And so that was very attractive for us. So then it was the challenge of just how do we convince or convey or convert people to eat a bug, you know, um, in, in order to help me to contribute to helping to save the planet or regenerate the planet. So that has been fun for us as well. You know, we both like to cook. 
Um, and again, we both like to eat. And so kind of figuring, figuring that piece out of if 80% of the world eats bugs and they have for centuries, why is it the U.S.? Um, and so, you know, when Zeb talks about the infrastructure, for me, I was an econ major. So that policy piece of it, of what does the infrastructure need to look like and how to change it and how to solve that problem. And so that has been the most probably intriguing part of the business of, OK, we can do this on a local, but how do we make this a national crop? How do we make this a national industry? You know, what things have to move? How do we need to shift people's perspectives around how they eat um, and and helping consumers understand what part they play in the value chain, that you're not just an end consumer. You know, markets are driven by what you will allow, by what you will take, by how you will shop, by how you will buy. You know, so I think back to growing up, tires were everywhere. You know, so we had a coalition around tires. You know, litter was everywhere. So we had a coalition initiative around, you know, um, littering the list goes on and on. So now we're in a food crisis. Now we're in a climate change crisis. It's no different. So what does that initiative need to look like? When we talk about the Green New Deal, how does that need to trickle down to communities where people see themselves as being a part of the New Deal? How does it impact me? How do I get involved? And so that's where I think the, the do-gooders, you know, social companies come into play to help people make that connection and show them the ways that they can do it at a very hyper, a very localized level. Um, that's something that's attainable. So that's what, th those are all of the reasons I think that made it attractive, attractive for me. That's great. I wanna be sure we leave enough time for the audience's questions. I do want you to please highlight ways so that people can get involved, whether that's investment opportunities or upcoming events that um, you can share. Zeb, you want to go first again? Yeah. Oh, well, definitely. Uh, you know, investment opportunities are definitely one of the uh, uh, one of the big ways. Um, I believe we are still we either just closed out our uh, our current round of funding, or are still seeking you know to finish to top that off. Uh, I think we're looking for about you know 1.5 million right now for this uh, current round. Um, but we also do have a nonprofit arm that uh, helps fund, uh, you know, us to feed more families, uh, you know, without having to have contracts with other any other government uh, sources. Um, so we do have that um, piece that I'll I'll drop the uh, our URL in the chat box, um, so we can you know people can go there if need be. Um, unfortunately, due to COVID, we don't, we aren't having volunteers at our pop-up events uh, anymore. Um, but other than that, that's it's pretty much. Uh, or just let let your you know let your friends, families, anybody who has a who has a food uh, service business know you know what it, what it is we do. If they want, if they have zero waste goals, we would definitely love to come out and do a waste audit. Um, and then we're also looking at you know not just collecting your food waste, we're also looking at collecting those recyclable. Or is Zeb a Kesey? Oh, I might have been. Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 might have been me. But uh, I think I was. I think I was leaving it off at. Um, you know, if, if you have, if anybody knows, has anybody who has a company that sells food, you know, definitely let them know what we do. We'd love to come out, do a waste audit, and you know, try to get them as close to zero waste as possible. Great. Okay. So heading into next year, fingers crossed, we'll be going into a seed round. So for us right now, we've been bootstrapping it for the last four years and we're ready to come out of that phase. Um, so we have the ways that people can get involved earlier. We are launching Atlanta uh, and potentially Southeast regions first ever into Living Lab. Um, and so we are looking for people who want to assist in helping us with our technical solution. Um, in particular, we are we have found one partner we're going to be working with on our IoT solution. So full IoT integration of the Grub Hatchery in and of itself. Um, so we would love if there are uh, students, high school students, if there are college students, you know, who want to help us once we launch also the, the accompanying SaaS solution of helping us collect data, of doing some research. As I said, we've got 50,000 things we want to do. 
but we're going to start with one. Um, but we would love to have people who are interested in just different ways that we can use insects for biopolymers, um, you know, to waste management, to other things to help us gather data and start doing some data methodology. Uh, and, and secondly, just come by and do a tour. Just come by, check us out. Um, marketing is something that we would love to. So if there's some social media college student guru out there. Please hit us up. Um, let us know. But yeah, so we'll definitely have things posted on our site and Instagram of ways once we launch the container that people can come out and volunteer and potentially do some pilots with us over the course of the next year. Fantastic. So let's turn to audience questions. And if any of you listening have questions, please put them in the chat. Um, but we already have a few. So let me start at the top. Um, Zeb, this is for you. As a waste management firm, how are you managing your exposure to potential lawsuits? For example, if someone becomes ill from food. Right. Yeah, so that's a good, good question. Could answer that. Yeah. So we uh, so we actually like to say we have a triple layered uh, solution. So one, there is the good, the Bill Emerson Good Samaritan Act, which automatically protects you from uh, any liability when making an in-kind donation. Yet we found that that was not enough for corporations. So we do have liability insurance as well, which keeps your insurance company out of it if anything were to happen. Um, and then we also do have uh, agreements that are hold harmless agreements that we all, all of our nonprofits and our network sign, which clears both Gooder and um, the original food donor of any liability. So to date, we haven't had any issues. Um, you know, those that that triple layer is held pretty strong for us. We haven't even had anybody get sick yet or have had any complaints about the quality of the food. Uh, so, you know, hope that we just keep along that path and we don't have to deal with that issue. Um, it may come at some point. Who knows? Hopefully not. Um, but we have we do have liability uh, protection within our uh, within our service. Casey, would you like to address that at all, or? Uh, well, for us, <laughs> not as large an issue. Um, typically, we're roasting our gloves and then putting them as a food additive into a food. And so we are licensed with the Georgia Department of Agriculture. Um, we do cook our products out of a shared kitchen. So we're following FDA and USDA. So we are compliant. Um, so ours is a little bit different where they're baked goods, they're dry mixes that we're typically making for people. So we're following the typical food guidelines and we haven't had any complaints yet in terms of the quality. Um, yeah, so, and yeah, so for us, we're not necessarily dealing, the food waste that we are taking in is going directly to the grubs as feed. And so we do have ways of kind of monitoring that the same way you would for a livestock, traditional livestock. Great. Thank you. So the next question is, how do you ensure the end user is not dumping the food or keep it to a minimum? That's a good question. So, um, you know, there's no 100% way for us to know exactly what they do with the food, but we do, in the agreement, we do also state that they won't sell it or just toss it out right when they get it, et cetera. Um, but so typically what we do is we make sure that the size of the, of the pickup that we have matches the size of the nonprofit that is going to. So typically, you know, if we're picking up for a hundred pounds of food, we're making sure that that nonprofit serves at least 20 people. Um, so that's just our way of, you know, making sure none of that food really goes to waste. Um, you know, a lot of the nonprofits that we work with, they do have a high need as well. Um, and, you know, we do always accept feedback and we send out surveys to our nonprofits to ask about, you know, the quality of the food they've been receiving. You know, if they're, you know, think they're receiving too much of one kind of food, um, you know, we, if we feel like, you know, if we, if we can mix it up, we're able to mix it up. Um, but, you know, to answer your question, there's no, you know, bulletproof way of knowing exactly, you know, what they're doing with it once it gets into their uh, refrigeration unit. Um, you know, but we make sure, you know, we do the best that we can. We actually we ask for their feedback um, and we make sure that it gets the right, the, the right, the, the right size donations gets to the right size uh, nonprofits. So we want to ensure that the, the food is, is eaten within that first 24 to 48 hours of them receiving the food from us. 
Keenan, I think the the for us the exact opposite. The grubs can they have about a, sh a shelf life of a year after they're roasted. So um, we don't have the, the same type of issue. You know, we're not necessarily doing. They're fresh when they get to you, of course, but they can last quite a bit of time depending on how we prepare them. Um, and the same thing with the goods that we produce with them, whatever we're using them in an additive with. Um, and and on the other end, food waste. We love it. So, <laughs> if, you know, we, we're trying to steal enough to alleviate as much as possible from a landfill. So in a case like a company like Bitter, we want to become a value add for that type of company. So if it's a food surplus company, they're probably, let's say 90%, hypothetically, they're going to be able to gift, you know, to a nonprofit and 10% of that may just be particularly waste. So our hope is, okay, we can take some of that off of your hands to add more value to you and also to your customer. Fantastic. I love how you two work together. It's great. Um, the next question is, is the sell by date that you see on food a hard cutoff point for recycling the food or do you recycle food that has not reached its sell by date? So for us, we're able to still donate food that, that goes by the sell-by date. The sell-by date is, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions around sell-by, best used by, um, expiration dates, et cetera. So sell-by date is really just for, I think, the um, not the manufacturer, but the actual, the retailer, uh, for them to get it out and keep a good rotation of inventory coming, going in and out of the store. That's really what that's for. Um, so yes, we still take food that is past the sell-by date. We do take food that is at the expiration date. Typically, you know, even though depending on what the food item is, of course, um, when things have have a labeled expiration date, it's typically not always expired at that date. Um, but uh, we still do take those items as well. Um, but depending on what it is, so things like, you know, dairy and things like that, if it's, you know, well past that expiration date, we will not take those types of items, um, simply because, you know, for the safety of the, uh, the nonprofits and organizations that we're going to take, that we're donating to. Um, but for things that, you know, that are very much, um, uh, non-perishable that may have an expiration date on them, we still do take those items. And again, for us, Keynet, our model is a little bit different in the sense that because they're bugs, we have different colonies for different uses. So you can, so there's some colonies we've kept going for years, you know, and all it's used for um, is getting rid of something. And it, you know, bugs don't care if it's buy, sell, date, you know, if used by, <laughs> um, it can even be spoiled in some cases. Uh, and again, if we're just using them just for the waste management piece, that's not something that's then being converted into a food product for human consumption. Um, we're more concerned about the mix of food waste that we may be getting um, because they are sensitive to things with high water concentration, which again, we use no water in production of them um, because of that. So they're just looking for starchy fruits and vegetables um, or some good old plastic and styrofoam, you know, that when we have a little mix around that. So it's not as much as an issue for us with our business model. The next question is, have you considered government contracts and have you considered submitting unsolicited proposals for government contracts? Oh, most definitely. I mean, yeah. like, uh, especially with COVID, uh, we've actually have won uh, a few different contracts here in the Atlanta metro area. So between city of Atlanta, Fulton County, DeKalb County, and I think a couple of others, uh, we've actually been, have been contracted to deliver um, grocery, a, meal, a week's worth of uh, groceries to the doorstep of many different individuals' homes. Um, so they actually give us the list of the recipients and then we just, you know, get the food and deliver it to them. Um, and we've actually kind of created a whole nother, you know, business vertical or a model uh, out of this that kind of, um, you know, folks kind of want to compare it to Instacart, but it's not exactly the same. Um, so instead of going shopping, you know, one for one, a driver for a recipient, uh, we pretty much have a fulfillment center where we have a lot of bulk ordering or, or bulk orders come in. Um, we, you know, create those bags in our fulfillment center and then our drivers go out on a route 
to, to deliver to uh, these individuals every single day. So right now we probably deliver somewhere between, it fluctuates somewhere between three and 5,000 uh, individuals every single week. Um, and, you know, those contracts, they really can range from about, you know, a month all the way up to about six months. Um, so we're just fortunate enough to just to keep getting them because they've definitely helped us uh, through COVID, keep, keeping the lights on. This is mostly like private, um, again, B2B, B2B, but we have started looking at government coming into 2021, you know, again, at the heart of why we started was around natural disaster. So we're looking at modeling around an MRE um, when you talk about trying to get, you know, food relief into countries. So we have been in some conversations um, with some people in Zimbabwe and a couple of other countries overseas of like, what does that look like? Uh, the biggest thing is, you know, typically... If you're talking about a war-torn area or an area that's been hit really hard by natural disaster, especially if it's not here, um, there there are political <laughs> negotiations that happen, you know, outside of look, what are the regulations for that country. And so again, if we can produce the equivalency of a cow on a, you know, the weight, portability, and the cost, you know, kind of go down, and so kind of gives a, a different grounds for negotiation when you're talking about trying to provide relief food relief or someone in another country. So those are the kind of government contracts we're trying to get ourselves set up for. Um, and when you talk about capital to do that, you know, those are one of the things that we're looking for investors to assist us with. Yeah. And I guess I'll add to that too, is that uh, other types of contracts that we've uh, tried or gone after, um, you know, residential compost and composting and recycling are one of the ones, uh, you know, to name a few. And then, um, you know, uh, you know, FEMA type contracts as well, you know, just being, being able to come in and help support uh, with, you know, with any type of uh, food needs there are, um, as well as, you know, helping not just not facilitate, but helping connect the dots to uh, developing facilities that can recycle organic and plastic waste and convert those into fuels as well. Um, helping get, you know, the right people involved uh, in those types of contracts and projects, because at, at, at the end of the day, that'll definitely benefit um, our capabilities as well. Great. The next question um, is, have either of you researched how food waste may fit into the Green New Deal as championed by politicians? Yeah, let's see. Heck yeah. <laughs> um, can't go into like great detail because I'm a number of things have changed in it. So I'm going back up trying to ramp. We're trying to ramp ourselves back up. But definitely for us, when they talk about biomass and when they talk about agriculture, um, that's a big component of it. But again, when you talk about policymaking for us around a market that's emerging, it's one thing to speak to it is another to actually have it executed and implemented and the right people to do that. And so for us in the Intel market, that hasn't necessarily happened yet. You know, for example, when they were doing COVID relief funding and we got something from a partner we were with in agriculture, no crop on there pertained to us. You know, so there was no category. Bugs weren't classified in any manner. So it was those type of things of like, yeah, you know, people talk emerging, we want to do it. But on the back end, there's just a lot of different infrastructural components and pieces that haven't been thought through or, or thought about. So policy reform and policy making, decision making, and again, being able to provide data to support it is a big, big thing for us. That's a big initiative for us. Yeah, I'll second what Akizi said. And I can also add to um, no, I haven't looked very much into uh, the Green New Deal. Um, but I actually did have a conversation with uh, a potential future partner uh, earlier today, and he was showing me that, you know, the Biden campaign is, is, is you know, looking at putting about $400 billion towards uh, research and infrastructure for, you know, biodiesel fuels and pretty much the types of technology and, and recycling and uh, industrial uses of uh, organic waste that I was speaking to earlier, you know, food waste to, you know, energy and, and these diesel fuels. Um, you know, they were speaking on the amount of, you know, ethanol that's being used, how much corn is used for that, et cetera, to produce those types of fuels. Um, and then we, you know, with the amount of food waste that we have now, just in the U.S. alone, I mean, we really think that, you know, this may 
be a promising market, you know, help us get away from drilling oil, um, you know, especially converting the plastics back back into this oil base and creating fuels out of that also. So it's, I, I'm really excited to see, you know, for folks to put the money where their mouth is. Um, so, you know, folks like Akizi and myself can go out and, you know, actually, you know, get the job done. Not be easy. And, and I'm just glad, you know, Zeb says that because it's, I mean, it, it's, and not knocking it and I support it, you know, a hundred percent, but it is not an easy notion. You know, just some of the sustainable initiatives that I've seen even happening at the local level, there's a lot that goes into that. And there's a, you've got a lot of small farmers, a lot of industrialized, you know, small farmers that support industrial corporate farming. You have to think about just the entanglement of incentives and you know the technology and investments that those markets have have made and so what does it mean to make this huge paradigm shift you know and with new players coming in what are the qualifications what are the regulations what does safety look like you know there's so there's so many conversations that i hope are happening you know or if not need to happen and so when you've got you know the drawdown you know, that type, what are the things that you need to think about when you're talking about making such a huge paradigm shift to get to 2050, which is not very far away? Great points. So Casey, I have a question for you. Um, the audience member is saying, I am a startup founder focused in Central America and all of my projects are oriented around food slash community building. And I would love to know if you took any lessons from LATAM, I don't know if that's pronounced LATAM or if that's just LATAM, or other regions, oh, but they mean Latin America, oh, of course, or other regions of the world when exploring your idea. Um, so the co-founder is um, a huge historian. He is all about history and reads about permaculture and all types of things. Um, and so, also, we were fortunate enough to have friends from other regions, you know, where it was much more a part of the culture and, you know, in a part of everyday life. And so we've definitely been able to connect with some people, for example, in Zimbabwe, um, you know, a journalist turned farmer who was like, I have lots of land, got Mopani worms. Now, what do I do with them? You know, kind of thing. So and we have been in touch with some groups in Latin America of like, OK, it's an established market there. What are some of the pitfalls? What are things we need to think about? And again, coming back to not just the agricultural piece of like the operational piece, but regulatory wise, policy wise, what are things that we need to think about? How do we introduce it into our country? Um, and how do we make it safe for people? And how do we make it you know, economically beneficial for people as well? And so what does it look like to have more of a circular economy versus a linear one? And then how do you explain that to investors <laughs> um, who don't have a structure that fits your model necessarily? Um, so the ROI is going to take a little bit longer, you know, and social impact. You know, our metrics are a little bit different. They're all, not all money driven, you know, and the metrics look different. So we have definitely learned a lot of lessons from um, working with people in other countries, in Latin America in particular, and also Afri some African countries in particular. Fantastic. And Zeb, I have a question for you. Do you um, work with producers who have halal or kosher or organic or gluten-free requirements? And is it possible to track that sort of information about the food you're delivering? Yeah, so we actually do have uh, some nonprofits or organizations that do have those uh, dietary restrictions. Um, <clears throat> we did have in full transparency, we did have a hiccup in the past. And so we learned from that mistake. Uh, where we were um, we were delivering uh, some pizzas to a uh, a Muslim organization, and so within those pizzas there were pepperoni included. So definitely, um, you know, didn't realize that you know didn't had a had an oversight on the uh, you know looking actually looking in to see what um, on our end what you know exactly what types of pizzas were included in that pickup. Um, so, you know, when it comes to organizations, definitely had to get a, you know, any types of lists of, of, of restrictions. Um, and one thing that we are working on within our technology is for on the, when we develop the nonprofit side for them to include those types of dietary restrictions uh, within their profile. 
and then so basically what it what it'll do is if the uh, if the food pickup um, you know, if it kind of alert, did we get an alert saying, you know, you know, it's not going to match those two together, uh, for that pickup and delivery, because, you know, if there's, you know, pepperoni pizza at the food pickup, and then, you know, one of the options that the, um, that the portal is trying to send it to is a, is a Muslim organization, then it's not going to, it's going to, you know, not allow that connection to happen. So that's one of the things that we're working on in our technology. But right now, we just do it manually. And Akisi, does Wonder Grubs have um, those certifications or work, you know, um, with those different dietary restrictions? Uh, not in the same way. I mean, so our product is so currently, you know, our product is focused on people who are looking for like a low allergen, you know, low sugar or non-dairy, non-soy. So we do have a vegan base for our product. Um, so, and again, we're not necessarily you know, donating or you know putting out a product to a nonprofit. Ours are to end consumers who are purchasing that product. So they're specifically looking for a certain type of product and we're targeting those specific audiences. The, the uh, Probably the most restrictive requests we get are people looking for gluten-free products, which are something that we're working on right now. And the taste, you know, because that's really important um, that they don't taste or see the bug um, you know, in the product. So yeah, so our, our model is a little bit different in terms of how, what our distribution looks like to people. Well, I just want to close by giving you both a chance to just say any final words. I have to say, I'm so struck by the fact that you have to be everything from policymakers to culture change agents, um, you name it, on top of being successful entrepreneurs. So it's just incredibly impressive. And I just wonder if you have any final words of wisdom for our audience. I'll go. Um, so I'll leave everybody with this. You know, I truly believe in, you know, what I do. Not everybody is, you know, happy with this. I'd like to tell folks and people I'm one of the lucky ones. Um, but I like to leave everybody with, you know, if you truly believe in it, go out and, and do it, you know, figure out what your specific specialty is, what your skills, what, how your skill set can help, you know, move what you believe in forward. And then just, you know, just, just get it done. You know, I, I've, I've luckily, I've been able to find out, you know, what I'm good at uh, while I'm working here at Gooder. And, you know, I just like to stay in my lane because it, it just makes life a lot easier. And don't try to do everybody else's job because they'll just add builds up to stress. So I'll just leave it at that. That's great. Akisi? I mean, I think that pretty much summed it up. I mean, kind of the same thing. Um, it's it's going to take more than one solution for us to, to get to where we want to be. Um, and so, you know, people just realizing that they are a part of the solution as well as part of the problem. <laughs> so um, self-included and all in our own little way. So what are what are some, so coming into 2021, you know, what are some serious ways that you can commit? It doesn't have to be anything major. Um, you don't have to go out and start a company. It could be something just very small in your household, but how do you make those shifts to get to where we wanna be collectively, you know, as a nation? And then who are those companies, you know, being really intentional about who you support what product you buy and how you buy that product and what you do with that product. Um, you know, our goal is, you know, it, our goal is to, to serve a million people and be, you know, grossly successful. But at the same token, we hope to be out of business in 10, 15, 20 years if all goes well. Um, you know, so I, I would like a society where we should not have to exist. So, um, and if people can just make small little incremental changes, they add up to something really huge. Well, I just want to thank you both for the difference you're making in our Atlanta community and in the world. And thank you to our audience members for participating. This was a great panel. I learned a lot. I hope others did too. Everyone take care and have a rest, a wonderful rest of your day.